new beginning. New beginning. Welcome to the Grief Dreams Podcast. My name is Sean Ram alongside Dr. Joshua Black. Uh, it is a beautiful day to podcast and I'm really happy to be here today. Thank you all listeners for listening and tuning in. We hope uh, you enjoy each and every episode we put out. And again, we just appreciate your support. Dr. Black, how are you today? I'm doing good, Sean. I always love these moments where we get to talk to people about their life journey. And hopefully during this time where a lot of people's lives are change in many ways that these conversations can be a source of comfort for them as they try to work through their own losses and, and grief well said on today's podcast we have with us chelsea rushton and she holds a bfa in creative writing and an mfa in visual art her art practice integrates somatics ritual and spirituality to explore how creative process can document and facilitate personal and collective growth and evolution She works as a technical writer in the Department of Architecture at the University of California, Berkeley. Her parents both died suddenly within eight months of each other in 2018 when they were 69 and 71. Uh, And she has a website, www.chelshotel.com, C-H-E-L-S-H-O-T-E-L.com. Chelsea, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me, you too. It's great to be able to chat with you about your journey. And I noticed just even like sort of reading the bio, there's uh, a lot of programs in there I've never taken in my life when it comes to creative writing and visual art. And so I'm curious how you went down that pathway. Were you always a good writer? Did you just love to read? Like what, how did you get there? Um, I was always, I was always a writer. I was not a big reader. Um, I I got very heavily exposed to television at quite a young age. So reading, of course, you have to be old enough to learn how to read, but you never have to be old enough to learn how to watch television. So it, I had to learn how to be interested in reading quite a lot later in my life. But writing and drawing were like from the time that I could even hold a pencil, like before I even really knew how to make words in English. I was pretending to write because I could see my parents writing and I also wanted to be writing. Um, And it just came naturally to make up stories and make drawings that went with those stories. And when I think back through my life and my schooling, those were always my favorite times in school, art period and writing period. And um, I realized that I was pretty lucky because I know a lot of school children uh, don't even get to have those subjects in their day-to-day school lives. So even though they were relatively small parts of my schooling compared to things like math and science, I at least know that I had them. And then as soon as I was able to start making choices about how I could incorporate those more into my school days, I did. And my dad especially always very heavily encouraged my creative pursuits. And when it came time for me to start thinking about where I went, where I would go to university, he encouraged me to either go to art school or do a creative writing program. And my mom was a little bit more reserved in her encouragement because um, she also wanted me to become a professional, but she also didn't say no and she didn't object. And um, I feel incredibly fortunate that both of my parents really saw my creativity from an early age and, and, and encouraged it at every, at every step that they could. And I think that the it was it was very hard for me to choose when I went to university whether to go to art school or writing school. And because I have a pretty black and white mind, what seems the most practical for me at the time was to either go to the art school that was located in Calgary, which is my hometown, because it's one of the best art schools in Canada. At that time, it was called the Alberta College of Art and Design, and now it is called Alberta. University of the Arts or Alberta Arts University. They keep changing their name and it's very confusing. But anyway, they're they're a fantastic institution. And I thought, well, if I go to art school, I should go to a fantastic institution. And why wouldn't I go to the one in my hometown? But we didn't have we didn't have a really high level creative writing program. And my uh, my parents sent me to Victoria just on kind of like a little mental health holiday when I was trying to make this choice about where to go to school. And I absolutely fell in love with Victoria in January at its rainiest time. So I thought that was a good sign. And the University of Victoria has the best creative writing program in Canada. And because I connected so deeply with that place. I made the choice to pursue a creative writing degree at that time. And 
the way the fine arts department at UVic is structured is that if you pursue a major in the fine arts faculty, you can't also pursue a minor in that faculty, I, I believe. I could be wrong about this. All I know is that I couldn't be an art major and a writing major at the same time because the department was too small and it didn't have enough resources to support that. So I had to choose, I had to choose one. And it was right at the end of my creative writing degree that I discovered that I could take classes in the art education department. And I had no intention of pursuing an art education degree um, or teaching art in any capacity, but it enabled me to be engaged in a studio practice and to actually make my own work. And that was when the seed, I think, was planted that I still really wanted to pursue art in an academic context. And graduate school seemed to be the, the next logical step. So I thought, okay, I'll apply to graduate program in visual art, even though my undergraduate work has been in creative writing, and my goal in my graduate work will be to, to integrate art and writing somehow. And that was how I managed to kind of switch, switch fields in that way. Oh, it's interesting. Yeah, it's interesting. I'm glad your parents were both supportive enough to allow you to do that. I know when I was a kid, I loved art. Like, I was so obsessed with art. But my dad said there's like no work in that. You have to do math. And, you know, like he was praising me for my math ability. So that's basically where mm-hmm. I went towards. And then psychology came in afterwards. But I look back, I'm like, man, I miss those days where I was like doing pottery or doing canvases. And but you you had those parents that were able to support that in you. And I love that. I love yeah. hearing that. Thank you. Yeah. And I, the older I get and the more people that I talk to uh, in different professions, the more I hear people say that. Like I had a good friend in high school who was a very gifted artist and she also wanted to go to art school when she applied to university and her parents just said, no, um, you're, you're not allowed because you need to find a way to support yourself. And I think I, I don't know if it really is every parent's worst nightmare when their child tells them that they want to be an artist because our society really, really doesn't support artists. And if you want to be an artist, you pretty much have to commit yourself to finding ways to live that do not match what is, what is the status quo or what society expects of a productive member and i think that in many ways my life my life looks different than than other people's because of that but what i think is so important about people who get degrees in the arts is that my parents also made me take math at least through the end of high school like i tried to argue with them about uh grade 12 um pure math 30. i was like you guys like i don't need this to get into art school do I really have to take it? And both of them independently, like they were, they were separated. They were not a parental really unit, but independently, they each said to me, you have to take math 30 because it's not about the math. It's about the fact that this is teaching you how to think. It's teaching you a way to think about stuff. And I remember to this day, my mom saying that to me and she wasn't angry and she like, she was just completely calm about it. And I just realized like, okay, I can see her point. And as much as math teaches us ways to think about stuff, so do the arts, so do creative writing degrees. So, so does thinking about anything artistically. It asks, it asks people to look at the world in unconventional ways to ask questions that people aren't usually asking and to I would say there's even a problem solving element like there's a there's in terms of artistic media and the kind of work that you want to produce it's like okay well if I want to produce this effect how am I going to do this with the media that I have or the skills and techniques that I have but there are also like conceptual problems that artists can work to solve and the way an artist might look at a conceptual problem is gonna be different than the way a mathematician looks at that same problem. And it's not to say that one of those is gonna be more right than the other, it's just that they're different ways. So I feel like I got, at least up to the end of grade 12, a pretty balanced a pretty balanced view of, of how one can um, look at and approach the world. And I think that for artists, just knowing that, that this is actually teaching you a way to think, 
I think that's an important thing for anybody going into the arts to know. It's, I mean, yes, people can build their careers as artists, but it's also like kind of a layer deeper than that. It's about how you think about stuff. And then once you have that degree, once you know how to think in that way, you can apply it to any number of jobs or career paths, quote unquote, quote unquote. Yeah, no, that's a great point. I like I'm a firm believer in not just doubling down on strengths, but also kind of exploring those weaknesses. And not I'm not saying that math was a weakness for you. But like, it, I, like you said, it was a different way to look at something or, or think about something. And that is that's something that just in the end, you know, overcoming that challenge will just um, add more tools, I think, to your repertoire. Totally. It's just more tools in the toolbox. And I'm surprisingly good at math. I just don't want to do it. <laughs> yeah. You and me both. <laughs> well, so you're taking this course. So I'm curious when your losses occurred and if that changed the way you maybe perceived art a little bit or how you coped through art. So can you take us through when your first loss was of your parents? Yeah, I had uh, I had just come to California at the end of January 2018 as a visiting scholar to uh, work with this architecture professor on some research that she was doing on the effects of somatic design, sorry, the effects of somatic process in drawing and design and how being in touch with our bodies at a level where we can really experience our individual organs can affect how architects make their first drawings for elements of the built environment, furniture, buildings, public spaces. And when I first saw this research uh, a few years prior, I thought, hey, this, this has merit not only for architects, but also for artists. I had noticed, um, I had noticed some similar themes coming up in my own work that were mirroring what was happening for people when they were in a somatic state of consciousness during her research protocol. And that was how we originally connected and how I came to be here in the first place. So I had been in California for about two months and my mom was so incredibly excited for me because she knew that this was a huge professional opportunity for me. I was curating an exhibition. I was at the University of California at Berkeley, which is one of the U.S.'s like top five research institutions. She was she just like could not have been more excited. She was rooting so hard for me. And uh, at the time that I arrived here, uh, no one knew that she was sick, including her. And it it did not reveal itself until uh, the beginning of March that uh, she was having so much trouble breathing that she couldn't walk even more than a few steps without needing to stop and catch her breath. And I think that that had been occurring for her at like a slower rate, but she never, she was such a stoic person that she never complained about it. And it was something that I hadn't noticed as something that like maybe should be really checked out more thoroughly by her doctor or anything like that. So I had a phone conversation with her on March, uh, I think it was March 3rd. And she said that she had driven herself to the hospital and they took an x-ray of her lungs and they, they found what they determined to be a golf ball size lump in the top right quadrant of her right lung. And she immediately jumped to the conclusion that it was, uh, that it was lung cancer because two of her three older brothers also died at age 70 of lung cancer. Uh, They were all heavy smokers. And although my mom had quit smoking 20 years prior, like, you know, I think she did some pretty serious damage. And so we found that information out. But then, of course, the medical system needs to do things in its own time. So she was scheduled for a biopsy and she was scheduled for some respiratory tests. And we needed to wait for all of those things to happen. And um, I think it was just about two weeks later, she went to the hospital for some just like routine respiratory tests, like walk on the treadmill and we're going to measure your heart rate kind of thing. And uh, I had asked her if she wanted me to come back to Calgary so that I could be with her at these tests. And she said, absolutely not. We have no idea what's really going on yet. So I'm going to either go by myself or I'll take a, I'll take a friend with me and please don't come home from California because I don't want you to interrupt this incredibly important professional opportunity. 
And uh, I just kind of sat tight. It's very hard. I always listened to my parents. Like I was a very obedient child always. And like, I just trust the wisdom and authority of my parents um, and did so un until they died. So I, I just listened to my mom. I was like, okay, my mom said, don't come home. Uh, so I just kind of sat tight. And when she went to the hospital for the respiratory test, they admitted her immediately to, to care. Um, because they were just like, we don't know how it's gotten this far without you being seen by a medical professional in this way. And they admitted her to the hospital and then a whole bunch of stuff happened that like I don't even really know and don't understand because I wasn't there. And uh, she remained in the hospital for, I think it was 10 or 11 days and no one could really figure out exactly what was going on. She was diagnosed with pulmonary embolisms which are blood clots that were in her lungs and nobody they thought okay well maybe these pulmonary embolisms are causing her acute shortness of breath like she was having such acute shortness of breath that the doctors thought that this can't just be caused by this tumor in her lungs so they were trying to figure out what was going on but in their attempt to break up these pulmonary embolisms with blood thinners they could no longer biopsy the mass in her lung to determine you know if it was cancerous if it was how far along it was etc so there was this like waiting game of trying to deal with one issue and not being able to deal with the other and uh there were there was a long series of um, how shall I say, inconveniently scheduled events. And I found out, I found out, I don't know why I found out from my dad. My mom apparently wanted my dad to tell my sister and I that the lump was indeed terminal cancer. It was very advanced, stage 4B. I didn't even know there was a 4B cancer, but it was 4B metastasized cancer. And her oncologist was giving her about six months to live. So this, of course, was pretty shocking information to all of us, but we thought, okay, well, six months, like at least we have some time to see her and say our goodbyes and get her affairs in order. And then she died three days after that of what the doctors could only call acute respiratory failure. And the, the night that she died was the first night of my three-day Three days out of six months, I was installing this show in the gallery, and it was the only time in that whole period that I just couldn't really leave. Like, it was the single most important time that I had to be in X place at X time, and she died on the first night of that install, and um, there was a lot of conversation around going to Calgary versus not going to Calgary, and I won't... I'll, spare you all the details of that it was it was not pleasant conversation to be having um with my dad at that time and uh she died and my sister was actually en route to see her the plan that we created was that she my sister would go to calgary and i would follow her as soon as i finished installing this exhibition and it was only because my mom felt so strongly that this professional opportunity was so important that I shouldn't reschedule it or anything. And I look back on this whole situation and I just think, you know, like, honestly, no one here would have cared if the exhibition didn't get installed at that time. Although if I had gone home and saw my mother die, the exhibition may not have happened at all. So in some respects, it's probably for the best that I stayed, but I didn't, I didn't get to see her before she died and she died much more suddenly than, uh, than anybody was able to anticipate. So the rest of my time here as a visiting scholar through the spring of 2018 was just like a blur of, you know, trying to, trying to program this exhibition and like be present to that and also deal with the family dynamics um, around managing my mom's affairs and uh, working through a lot of emotional stuff that came up with our dad who had uh, been manipulative in his delivery of information about our mom's illness, which he was privy to and we were not. And uh, so about a month passed where we were all kind of remote. And then my dad traveled to Calgary himself to do some kind of on the ground things related to managing my mom's estate as her executor. And my sister and I joined him there to host some memorials for our mom in the middle of April. And uh, 
I noticed at that time, like, my dad was exceptionally shocked. Um, like, we were all shocked, but I didn't, I didn't expect to see such acute sadness from him. Um, they've been separated. They had been separated for over 20 years. And I knew that they, like, were still connected to each other and still loved each other at one level. I think it's, I think all parents do still love each other, even if they separate, because they share these children who they both love. But I was, I was really surprised to see just like the acuity of his feeling. And I also just started noticing some physical differences in him. Um, and I started to feel a little bit concerned about his health. Um, and I didn't really know any more than that. And on one day, we had a meeting with his bank manager to again deal with some estate affairs and she advised him on a certain point about his own accounts and just said you know dad in the event that you ever get sick dot 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 like knock on wood uh but these are things that you should really consider so that your girls don't have to go through this again and my dad just kind of rolled his eyes i think his dad didn't die until he was 95 and I think that my dad very strongly expected that he was also going to live until he was 95 or at least, you know, for a lot longer. And so he just kind of rolled his eyes at this advice. And um, we managed to get through that week of my mom's memorials and my dad managed to wrap up most of the major work associated with um, settling my mom's affairs. And then we all got to take some deep breaths. My dad drove back to his little house on Gabriel Island in British Columbia, where he retired to in 2009. And, and uh, everybody just took some time to calm down. And I was traveling with Galen. We, um, we, she, she did a public lecture in Chicago and, um, and brought me with her, which was a really nice relief to just be in a new place. And, and kind of be distracted from all the things that I had just been so overwhelmed by. And I got a text message from one of my dad's closest friends to say, you know, just a heads up, Chelsea. Like I saw this is a this is a TMI warning. So if you don't want to hear about acute illness, just cover your ears for a sec. She was like, I saw your dad, and like he just randomly puked in his driveway, and it seems kind of weird. So you might want to call him and ask him how he's doing. So of course, I immediately called my dad and asked how he was doing. And he just completely wrote it off. He said, it's a stomach bug. It's been going around, like I've just haven't been feeling very well. And I just thought, well, you know, okay, like maybe, maybe you've also been very stressed. You're very tired. You're going through a grief process. Like I knew, I didn't know very much about grief processes, but by that time, I at least knew from my own experience that like, of course it's normal to get really tired or of course it's normal to experience kind of unusual physical symptoms and like maybe this is just part of his grief process but i and his friend started kind of pressing him on what this illness was and he went to his family doctor and one month later he received a preliminary diagnosis of acute myeloid leukemia which is by nature a terminal disease nobody knows how people contract it um, or what its causes are and there is no cure so that was uh, that was the day before his 70th 71st birthday in mid-june uh, so my mom died March 31st and my dad got this diagnosis on June 14th and it was confirmed about four days later with a, with a bone marrow biopsy. And uh, I think the fact that his general practitioner was a very good friend of his and really advocated for him with the hospitals, he was able to get my dad on a protocol of uh, oral chemotherapy, pill chemotherapy, and also regular blood transfusions to keep him alive as long as possible, uh, really. And um, my dad was able to live for just about six months. He died on December 4th, 2018. And fortunately for me, I didn't have a job at that time. <laughs> so it just was like the whole, the whole thing just kind of washed over me like it just kind of took over my life I didn't have any like regular responsibilities or professional obligations to kind of hold me to one place so there was it was a lot of traveling a lot of traveling it's just a lot of thoughts about a whole bunch of things I had never put any thought into before wills 
bank accounts, beneficiaries, tax returns, lawyers, legal fees, the costs of dying, like all these kinds of things. So I, I feel like, I feel like I really got in one year, a huge crash course on all manner of practical, material, emotional, and spiritual aspects of the death and dying process. And now that I've come to the end of that piece, I remember <laughs> like 20 minutes ago, you asked me how this has changed my art practice. And I think that my art practice in many ways actually really well prepared me for this at an emotional and spiritual level because I've been practicing yoga since 2000 and 2007, seriously. And one of the biggest themes that come up in that comes up in yoga is the fact that our bodies are not permanent and that life and death are two opposite sides of the same coin. And through graduate school, I also got really interested in um, Jungian ideas about how opposites can interact as as a dynamic equilibrium and not necessarily as one being good versus one being bad, which is how modern society often uh, tries to conceive of of opposites as as assigning each one a moral value. And I really don't view opposites in that way. And I also through my through my independent and academic studies have come into a lot of uh, wisdom from other traditions about reincarnation and about, you know, what, what dying can look like according to those traditions. And I've also had some experience with psychics and, you know, people who were able to communicate with people who have crossed over, like these ideas were not new to me. So when my parents, when my parents each died, I felt like I had a lot of tools in my toolbox, as it were, to to process that loss. And a lot of the work that I did through my through my graduate degree was <laughs> like my whole my the, the imagery of my entire master's thesis is a sacred diagram of death and rebirth. So I kind of held fast to that imagery a lot during that time because it's a really fundamental part of how I think about the world. And um, when my parents died, I had absolutely no time, space, energy to have a quiet, contemplative, meditative practice. Like there was always some fire to put out. There was always some piece of administration that I had to deal with or some bill to pay. Like my whole life just became completely taken over by like these mundane things that made me realize like, oh, this is why adults feel like they never get to play or have fun because their whole lives are just taken <laughs> over by this bill and this mortgage payments and this, you know, just whatever. Um, and I really felt a lot of, I, I really just felt a lot of sympathy and compassion for like the average adult in this world, because it was, it was, a lot, I mean, I have bills, but like, you know, I have a few bills that get paid automatically by my credit card. Like I don't have to actually do anything. My tax return takes like 20 minutes on simple tax. You know, it's like a very, I've had a very simple life until my parents died. So I was not able to make work in the way that I was used to in this like very dedicated, quiet space where nobody interrupts me, or I have no thoughts that are interrupting me, or this doesn't get to be the number one priority of how I spend my time. Like suddenly my art practice was no longer priority number one because it couldn't be. So I started making a lot of very small drawings in the like moleskin, like I think it's about three by five inches that I just carry in my purse. And I would make them while I was waiting for a bus or while I was waiting for a ferry. It was, I became very like William Carlos Williams, um, who is a, who's a quite prominent poet who makes, he, he wrote very small poems and it was because he actually made his living as a medical doctor and he just jotted little poems on his prescription pad in between patients. And um, I was told that in my creative writing program and I was able to remember that at this time. And it's like, okay, Chels, whatever time you have to create something is a time that you can use, even if it's not the way you want it to be, even if it's not the way it used to be, even if it's not as much time as you want to have, just use it. And it took a lot of discipline to do that because there have been a lot of times where I just want to do nothing. But my drawings became very small. I didn't spend a lot of time painting. 
because often I was doing the drawings while I was in transit and they were, those drawings were very, very concerned with relations between people who are still here on the earth plane and people who have crossed over to the other side. And those drawings, for those of you who are interested, are available to uh, look at on my website. Um, if you navigate to chelsehotel.com, click on art, and then there's a little drop down menu. And on that drop down menu, just click on the other side. And that's what that series of drawings has been called. I still work on it at a pretty slow rate. I've been able to start painting a little bit more. And that feels, it feels really nice to be able to process through painting. And I think that I think that probably forever at this point I will I will always be engaged at one level with the relationship of life and death. And that I feel like that will always now be evident in the work that I do. Wow. That's um <laughs> that thank, was a thank you. Sorry, no, guys. No, 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 thank you. You know what it is is that you're very concise and level headed about telling that portion of your story and I think that just shows how art has played an important role in your life you know it's it's and another... maybe also math <laughs> <laughs> all right let's not take it too far um, but, but um you know it's 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 that language that as a child you developed you fell in love with you carry with you to this day and isn't art's just that beautiful thing? It's that expression of, you know, the, the human soul. And that, in a way, has prepared you a lot for uh, the events in your life and being able to, you know, even these small drawings that I'm actually looking at right now, which are like amazing. And I would imagine therapeutic in a lot of ways of being able yeah, to just. They're... Yeah, get that idea, get those thoughts out on paper and see them come to life. Absolutely. And it, this has been coming up a lot for me recently, um, art as a therapeutic practice. I've been, since January, I've been working uh, remotely over Zoom with a, with a practitioner here who's, um, who facilitates something called the Tamalpa Life Art Process. And it's a, it's a method that was developed here in the Bay Area by a dancer and body worker. And I would describe it as basically like a, a conscious dance party to great music that gives you time at the end to integrate your movement experience through writing, drawing, painting. And it's, it's intended to be a therapeutic process and as part of a larger therapeutic process for people to learn about themselves, learn about feelings that are like stored in our bodies. Like I think there is scientific research that now shows that we hold memories and actual like muscle and other systems structures in our bodies beyond just our brains and this process can really help people access that information and I had a professor in graduate school who just was obsessed with asking me is your work art or is it art therapy and I was just continuously stumped by this question because I don't see a difference and I, I, I wasn't able really to articulate that for him at that time because it seemed like such an unsatisfactory, unsatisfactory answer for him. But the more, the more I practice as an artist, the more I realize that making work isn't, for me, it's not about making something that's going to be easily consumable by other people. It's about making work that shows me layers of myself that I didn't know were there and that helps other people see those layers in their own selves. So art for me is necessarily therapeutic. And I guess I just want to say that. <laughs> so, Jay, yeah. Yeah. And I think like. <laughs> That's my answer to your question. Yeah, I agree. And I think if you start veering towards making art for other people i think that 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 dips into a different category almost yeah i i really i really do believe that i think i think each each and every artist kind of um hopefully it comes from a spot that is you that's your soul that's your feeling vision um thought process um and and that's that's something as humans, I mean, obviously we've been doing it for a long time and it's such an innate feature of it. But, you know, to, to have that in your life uh, and then have obviously the events 
that you've gone through. And also what's crazy is, is how the events played out, like how, you know, your mom got diagnosed and initially it was six months and then it, all of a sudden three, three days later she passes. Mm -hmm. And then it just so happened to kind of coincide with, you know, I know you were saying like within two or three months, you only did the installation three days out of that time. Like that's a, that's a crazy timeline there. And then when your dad yeah. passing and that happening and, Wow. Um, yeah. Yeah. Multiple loss is a very interesting thing, Sean. I haven't had to deal with that, but like you have. And so what do you take from that? Is it like, what's your experience with having a multiple loss? I know you're talking about the challenges of doing the paperwork and settling estates and stuff, which I've never had to deal with, which is great. When my dad died, it was my, my, his mother. So my grandma that did that. And she kept saying how ridiculously hard it was for her to do it because you're grieving and trying to do this stuff at the same time. But like the Absolutely. multiple losses, like how was that for you in the sense of processing grief? Uh, it was, it was very difficult for me. I feel a hundred percent confident saying that every person's experience of multiple losses will be different and the particulars of mine were first that it really felt to me like my dad was kind of stealing my mom's thunder because he got so sick right after she died that it totally rerouted my grief process and I needed to focus pretty much all of my vital energy on how we were going to deal with this this next phase of illness so the grief that I felt and the ways that I was processing that grief around my mom really got halted. And then there were a lot of issues that came up for me around how my dad behaved immediately before and after my mom's death that like, for the first time in my life, I felt betrayed by him. And he was in many ways, the parent that I constantly turned to to feel safe. My mom had always been a warrior and my dad had always been very proactive, can do any problem. We can solve it. It's going to be okay, Charles. Here's a big hug. Like it just, he was, he was my, my comfort parent. And so to, to have experienced, to have witnessed him so extremely twist and manipulate information that in short had he been up front with my sister and I we would have been able to make plans and to see our mother before she had died if he had not manipulated information to prevent us from seeing her I think that a lot of my ensuing emotions would have they wouldn't have happened but there were a lot of feelings of betrayal of mistrust of extreme anger. I've, I've honestly never felt so angry at a person in my entire life. And to be that angry at somebody who also has a terminal illness and I know is going to die is a very, very hard combination of emotions to hold because I simply was not ready to forgive him. And then he died. And <sighs> that sucks. Like one of, I think one of the biggest cultural fears around death and dying is the regrets that people feel both on their deathbeds as they're dying and the regrets that the living feel after the person who passed has gone of things that they could have said, of things that they didn't say, of things that they wanted to say or do, or that they didn't do enough. And my, the way my, each parent died was so different. Like my mom was so stoic. She didn't want to tell us what was really going on. Her death was very fast. My dad wanted everybody to know every detail about what was going on for him, like to the point where he was delivering TMIs to people who really didn't need to know the level of information he was trying to convey to them. And he wanted the people who he loved to be present with him every single step of the way. And Caring for a person who you're extremely angry at, who I was extremely angry at, was also incredibly difficult. And there was just a lot, there was just a lot of hard stuff to get through. And I had to do some really serious thinking about how, how I could 
be present to my dad in his final months and days based on the very real emotions that I was experiencing. And it was, it was a lot. And my dad, I mean, if somebody asked me, do you have any regrets? Like there are some certainly that I could list now. There are some maybe that I won't feel until later. Like I feel, I actually feel like I'm still pretty early on in my, in my grief processes. Um, so I know, I know that layers will be uncovered as, as the months and years pass and as my life becomes a little bit more settled, um, especially because right after my dad died, I took a job in the United States, which is a totally different country. So there was like a lot, there was a lot of, a lot of shifting and changing. And I am just now feeling like my life is sort of settling and I'm able to kind of take quiet space and be at my death altar and like look at pictures of my parents and just be able to feel into those experiences without having so many practical things weighing on me that need attention. Um, and I feel I feel like there are times now where I'm a little bit more able to like put my dad aside and go back to this grief on my mom. Like I really felt like I had to put a bookmark on that and, and then just be with my dad in the way that I could through all of his stuff. And, and now that they've both died, there are times when I can like grieve their losses simultaneously because they, they were both my parents. So it's like, in that in that way it's kind of like i can i can merge those two grief files in my mind um in in a way but then there are moments certainly of of grief that i feel for each individual parent and i notice that the, those moments just kind of come up naturally and are are triggered by you know things that are just happening in in my environment like something that I see or a song that I hear on the radio or, you know, just things that make me think of one or other of those parents. And it's actually, in a way, it's almost kind of a relief that, I mean, it's not a relief that they're both dead. I really wish they were both still here. But the fact that they're both dead, I, it's it's like there's no, nobody's competing for attention in my own mind anymore. Um, and they can kind of just like both be there in the in the way that they that they need to so I I think I think that is about what I can say on that grief is not linear but the events of our lives more or less are and the biggest the biggest experience that I noticed was having to put a bookmark on one grief in order to start dealing with another one yeah that's so interesting for me to hear because I've you know, I've talked to different people, but I'm really, you know, there's different conversations you have based on what they share. And I was really curious on how you handled that. And it's interesting that you do, or you could put a bookmark on one aspect of a loss to really focus on the the one you wanted to. And I'm glad you're able to do it, right? Like we all have different talents and skills and and ways to be able to process things. And I'm glad you're able to find a way that it didn't overwhelm you. Because you said they're very different, you had different emotions, mm -hmm. but you found a way. Yeah, I found a way. And um, I heard that you said that I bookmarked one to be able to deal with the one that I wanted to. And it, in many ways, it, it, dealing with my dad's grief was not the grief that I wanted to deal with. It was the one that demanded my attention at that time. And it gave me a lot of insight into into how parents have to operate because it's it's not about what they want at all. It's about what the situation demands from them. Mm -hmm. And it really it really was like my reflex to just respond to the demand of that time. And I feel I feel grateful that I was able to do that. And, and you're I still doing yeah. it, right? In the sense that it's mm -hmm. only been just under not even two years yet. So mm -hmm. Like there's so much that you're still going to continue to learn for yourself and try to process, but it's, it's amazing that you're, it, how you dealt with that. I'm really interested in and that you're able to, because you say like, I've only lost my dad at once. If I lost my mom soon after that, like I'd be in a different story. Like, I don't know where I would be personally. Cause you know, like I, they both had a certain impact on my life. Yeah, and absolutely. And, the one couldn't and, take uh, over the other. Yeah. Yeah. And there's, in my experience, 
uh, there's a different quality to those to those griefs, like, and people that I've talked to also who have experienced the loss of their mom or both of their parents, like, I mean, when the person who physically carried you and housed you while you developed as a human being and then birthed you, like when that person dies, I feel like there's an existential crisis that's unavoidable. Like the, I remember driving in Calgary just a couple of months after my mom died. I was on one of our, one of our little highways, Crow Child Trail. And I just suddenly, the revelation just like smacked me in the face, like the tunnel that I traveled through to be here on this earth just collapsed and dissolved and is not here anymore. And how could it possibly be that I continue to exist when the avenue through which I arrived no longer exists? And I just burst out crying. There was nowhere for me to pull over. And so I just had to kind of deal with it. But it was like, it was, it was huge to know that the person who brought me into this world is, is no longer here. Like that's, that's, I have not experienced that same that same aspect of grief with my dad like I know that he had a part in making me but he didn't carry me for nine months and then you know have a 26 hour labor (laughs) and it's just yeah it's I've really I've developed a whole lot of respect for parents on so many levels through this process and it's also really amazing that you you only can realize some things after the people about whom those things are relevant have died. Like that's, it's really so true. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you have just hearing you talk, you have uh, a very mature uh, way of speaking about this. Like you have a very firm understanding uh, and about what's going on. You know, even when you were saying that, like, it's not linear and, and, you know, and I think you, from what I, from what you're saying, I think, you know, that like putting, one person bookmarking one and and focusing on the other doesn't mean that you're not going to eventually revisit, you Mm -hmm. know, those other areas that are uncomfortable. That's just, that's something I think you're very well aware of. And I think that that awareness is very mature even in understanding and processing all of this. And, uh, you know, that's, it's tough. It's tough. And, and there's people with complicated relationships and, and, uh, you know, even um, last time you see someone and the last words and regrets and, and all this, you know, that that's a that sometimes that can be a part of grief and, and it, it can be very difficult to come to terms with some of those things years later. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for that reflection. I mean, just just hearing you say that piece about last words, like my dad's last words to me were about discomfort that he felt in his anus in his bed in the palliative care unit of the Nanaimo Regional General Hospital. And it's like, those are not the last words that I wish my dad yeah, had Yeah, maybe not the most me. poetic. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I think as an artist, um, you can, as an artist, you can appreciate <laughs> the visceral nature of the topic at hand. And yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and like, it was, I mean, it, in context of him, it was like he was also trying to explain to a nurse after he had been sedated at 1230 in the morning that the method in which they were installing his catheter was incorrect. And I later found out from the same nurse that while he was in palliative care, he developed his own method for cal- catheters so that he wouldn't have to have that catheter balloon inflating his bladder. And he had instead it, it somehow installed some kind of vacuum release valve on his tube like he was an engineer like he was just constantly building stuff inventing stuff and it like that's how he was until his literally very last moments and um you know I reflect on these last words that he said to me and that he asked me to record on my iPhone so I literally have a voice memo of his just like extremely weak almost dead voice talking to me about his physical discomfort which I can't bear to listen to by the way and I also can't bear to delete it um and it's just like it really just reminds me about how how many expectations we all have about everything, not just death related, but everything. Like everybody has a story in their mind about how they want something to go. And I think that so much of regret happens 
when we can't let go of that story if what actually happens is different from that. And it's like, yeah, of course, I didn't want my dad's last words to me to be about that. Like, I would have loved to just sat beside him and say, like, Dad, I love you so much. You know, it's okay for you to exit. I'm going to take care of everything for you. I'm your firstborn child. You can trust me. I had been able to say that to him in other ways at other times. But it would have been great to just like have that, you know, poetic moment. But like the reality of the situation was totally different. Like a dying person on sedative drugs is not attractive, as Joshua, you've probably witnessed in your work in hospice care. Like my dad's eyes were doing some pretty crazy things. And it was very clear to me that he was on his way out. And um, just the piece of being able to let go of our expectations in times of such heightened importance and feeling. I like if I were ever to advise anybody who who is going to see somebody who they know who is dying, that would be my piece of advice. Like just let go of any expectations that you have yeah. about what you think might happen and just be as present as you can to what is happening. Yeah, that's great advice. And I think sometimes we buy into the movies of how things end in movies. Like, you know, you get that opportunity to sit by someone's deathbed or, you know, as they, as they're dying, they whisper, you know, (laughs) into your ear, I love you and whatever, whatever. And it's just not the reality. It really is. Maybe sometimes. 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 Oh, no. Yeah, for sure. Some people get lucky (laughs) in life. Some people get that fortunate circumstance or, you know, maybe someone's dying uh, and you have a week or something and maybe you have those opportunities. And we've talked to a lot of people who who have, uh, you know, had that moment when someone's dying. We've also talked to people who didn't get those opportunities, who didn't get to say the last words or didn't, didn't even get to see that individual when they were dying or the, just the circumstances around it, you know, the death was so tragic or whatever, it just didn't happen. And I think that's, uh, happens a lot. That's the majority almost, I, I, I'm guessing, but like, I don't think most people get that sweet moment that the movies kind of show. And mm. I think you're absolutely right. I think, you know, having the expectations have to be mitigated and things have to, be, you know, you really have to come to a level head and kind of just take things as they are in the moment. Um, easier said than done, obviously, but um, mm-hmm. no, I, mm-hmm. I think that's, if anything, it's it's a good piece of advice. I think it's a good time to transfer to dreams. So mm-hmm. because you had such a different relationship after the individuals have died, so your mom, you didn't get a chance to see her, right, when you were hoping to, and so it was that, that suddenness and that shock to it. And when it comes to your dad, you had a lot of anger and, and mistrust. Um, with him as he was dying so I'm curious about the dreams have you had any dreams of either one of those people and what did that look like yeah yeah I've actually had um I've I wish now of course you know retrospective vision is always 2020 uh the dreams were always so strong at the time that I woke up that I thought oh I don't need to write these down I'm going to remember them forever (laughs) and of course you know I I can't um that's not the nature of dreams but yes I have had multiple dreams about each parent I don't I'm trying to remember if I've had any dreams where both of them are together and I know I've had dreams where like I'm going from one to the other but I don't think I've had a dream where both of them have been together Um, and the nature of those dreams about each of my parents has been by and large very different I think the the first dream that I would say I had about my mom was like a conscious dream or a vision. Uh, and I, I, the night that she died, I didn't, I didn't consciously know she was dying. I didn't rationally know that she was dying, but I just like, I couldn't sleep that night. And the whole month, I of course was very anxious. I was very worried. I was very sad. Like I was having a lot of um, preemptive grief and the way that I was able to help myself fall asleep was through this yogic practice of, of metta or love where you uh, envision a pink light around a, a particular person. And every night before I went to sleep, I would just envision my mom inside a bubble of pink light. 
and that would be the vision that would help me ultimately go to sleep. And the night that she died, I was still awake at about 11.30, and I needed to wake up at about 3.30 in the morning with my dad to drive my sister to the airport so that she could go to Calgary, and I just couldn't sleep, and I was just like... I think I just knew before I knew and I texted two of my very good friends in a in a group message and I said, you guys, can you just send me some extra love right now? I think my mom is going to die soon. And uh, they both responded to me right away, which was kind of a miracle because it was so late. And then I just laid back down and just envisioned my mom in a bubble of pink light until I was finally able to fall asleep. And I didn't find out until uh, late the next morning that she had died, but she died at the time that I was doing this envisioning. Um, She died at 1.30 a.m. Mountain Time, and I, at 12.30 a.m. Pacific Time, was doing this envisioning. And a friend of mine later reflected to me, you know, like, you you weren't there physically, Chels, but maybe if you had been there physically, you wouldn't have been able to provide this kind of energetic support for her that you did. And it's my belief that, that energetic support is not dependent on physical proximity. And I was really grateful for that reflection because it it helped me to realize that I was with her at the time of her death, even though I wasn't physically present. And I would say that that was the first dream that I had about her, even though I was awake. And then I started dreaming about her like within days. And Joshua, it was interesting when I read your research because you say that a lot of people don't start dreaming about their deceased loved ones until weeks, months, maybe even years after their after their passing. And for me, it was just like literally instant. Um, I also would have some waking visions and I would be able to communicate with her, I would say, like, I feel like I have an ability to communicate with people who have crossed over that has come out of this experience. And I also, while I was sleeping, would have dreams about her. And I recall that in the earliest days after her death, the dreams would always be of me seeing my mom in perfect health, radiant happiness, and I could see her, but she couldn't see me. And I would be like trying to connect with her, but there would be like the glass wall or like a bubble or something. And she just like wouldn't know that I was there, but I was able to see her like returned to, I kind of want to say like a perfected state, like just my mom at her best, which of course was very sad for me to process in the moment. Like I would wake up and like, I would have such a strong image of my like perfect, beautiful, happy mom and then have to come to the re-realization over again that she was dead. But mostly, like, even though there's sadness there, it was it was really nice to just be greeted by those images of her. Like, I really felt like those dreams were being delivered from her to me so that she could just reassure me, like, hey, I'm okay. I'm okay now. I haven't dreamed about her very much lately. The last dream that I had about her is the one that's clearest in my memory. And well, actually, I don't think this was the last dream I had about her, but the last dream that was like about about her that I would consider a grief dream and not just like a dream about something else in which she is a minor figure was in the summer of this past year. And uh, the dream was that I, I was in her house, which in real life is now a rental property that my sister and I manage. And even though it was my mom's house in the dream, it was also our then current tenant's house. So I was in my tenant's house, but it was still my mom's house. And I went up the stairs to the master bedroom, which was my mom's bedroom. And I entered the bedroom and all the furniture was in the same configuration that it was when my mom was alive. It was all her furniture. And she was sitting at the chair at her desk, which was her main chair. And I sat down at a smaller chair next to her and um, we looked at each other. Look, we were having very firm eye contact in the dream, which is something that I don't experience very often in dreams. And she looked into my eyes and she said, Chels, I have lung cancer. And that was the end of the dream. And um, I was working with a family constellation therapist at that time. And told the told the therapist about that dream, and you know we did some we did some work with that afterwards. But it was it was very profound for me because it was like my mom. I believe like 
uh, what do I want to say? I think that when we release ourselves from our physical form, I believe in reincarnation, but I also believe somehow that at some level, each person who has ever lived can still live and communicate with us at like an energetic level or an astral level or something. Um, I don't have a scientific explanation for that, but it, it felt to me like my mom was reaching back and, and just like trying to correct her lack of communication around her illness, because if she too had been more straightforward about the information she had been receiving, my sister and I would have been able to see her in time. So it was both my mom's responsibility and my dad's that we weren't able to see her before she died. So that was, that was such a special dream for me because we got to, we got to connect, we got to acknowledge each other in that dream. And it was also like she was actively making something right that hadn't previously been right. And um, wow. when I look, when I look back on, on all of those dreams, it was like, it was like they were all there for me as like little helper tools to just like, just help me know that she was, that she was on the other side. That's My beautiful. dad. I think, hold on. You, hold yeah. on. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think it was beautiful that to like, you're able to see the dreams in that way to help you with especially because you're drawing those the other side and, um a lot too so like you're you had this idea going through and you looked at your dreams in such a certain way i was the way you i was like i was curious how you saw that last dream and then when you're talking about it, i'm like oh wow because when we were talking on the podcast it was all about the anger you had for your father for not telling you and holding back information mm -hmm. but i never mm -hmm. once thought but then your mom had the information right but then there's in the dream, you're, you're saying like she's acknowledged because she could have done better also. And yep. there's that unacknowledged anger that maybe was being projected with him or, or on him unfairly because there is also the section for your mom that she needs to hold. And that dream really got you there because she was able to um, acknowledge that in her own way and then allow mm -hmm. you to almost forgive her because you're like, all oh, right, yeah there's a part there that, yeah, I wish you would have said that earlier. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, they were both at fault, but she was mm. dead. So I, was <laughs> <hard> to, <laughs> it's um, hard to be angry at a dead person. I gotta say, <laughs> Yeah, and it's like, I mean, I also try to understand her position in that. Like um, she was married to my dad. Like she, they obviously had a certain, they had a relationship that I don't know anything about. Like children will never know the complexities of their parents' marital relationship or romantic relationship or even friendship. And the fact, like, there's still even a part of me that's like, okay, well, if my mom on her deathbed trusted my dad with this information and trusted him to tell us this information, she must have had a reason for it. Like, I don't agree with it. And I also... I mean, my sister looked through their text message correspondence and I couldn't even bear to do that. So she has mm -hmm. feelings and experiences that I don't have because she has information that I don't have. But what I know is that my mom was dying and she made the best decisions that she possibly could. And my dad at that time was not dying and he did not make the best decisions that he possibly could. So it, it but still like that acknowledgement of her responsibility in how the situation played out certainly remains and it was like when I woke up from that dream I was like whoa yeah okay like she's she's literally reaching back through time and and um amending her communication to me uh, that's I think it's phenomenal because there's a lot in our, our emotions that we don't fully understand and where it's coming from and there's a lot underneath the surface and some of these dreams as you're saying can really get to the point of some of the stuff maybe that we're just not acknowledging based on how we're dealing with the current situation. And you said it's mm -hmm. hard to be mad at someone that's dead. It's so much easier <laughs> to be angry at people who are alive. You know, like if you really look at who <laughs> yeah. you're angry at right now, it's they're probably alive. <laughs> yeah. I mean, so, I know there are people who are also angry at people who are dead, but right. like when my dad died, a lot of my anger dissolved right along with it. It's like, it's, mm. in my experience, it's pretty hard to be angry at a person who's dead. Yeah. I think you have more compassion for them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, like absolutely, your heart goes out to them now because they're dead rather than there so i'm curious now so what dreams did you have of your father 
again, I can't remember a lot of uh, details around specific dreams. Um, the dream that I shared with you, Joshua, for your Instagram uh, was a. It came a little bit later in my in my dream sequence about my dad. I noticed that I also, within days of his death, I started dreaming about him. It was like within 48 hours in both cases. And the the initial, the earliest dreams that I had about my dad were always dreams in which he was still sick, needing help, not communicating his needs clearly. And there was always some like very slimy feeling of like deeply... Uh, what's the word I want? Deeply ingrained illness, like something, just a general atmospheric sensation in the dream that something is dreadfully wrong mm. and no no immediate way to solve it. And sometimes I was trying to get to him. Sometimes I was already with him, but it was it was a marked difference because for several dreams in a row, I would just be back with him and he was still sick and still sick and still sick. And because I had already had all these nice dreams about my mom, which I felt as kind of touchstones for me to like, as though she was giving them to me as gifts, like showing up for me on the astral plane so that I could, so that those dreams could help me process. I, tr I approach the dreams about my dad from kind of the same perspective. Like, is my dad talking to me about the other side? And like, he's, there are still these unresolved issues about his sickness and like, what can I do? But there wasn't, there was no like sense of closure in those dreams. There was no sense of something being accomplished or resolved. It was just like being put back into the same problem again and again and again with like no real way out of it. And those, those dreams were um, quite different to wake up from uh, than, the, than the dreams about my mom. Um, and then I think that pattern broke when I wrote to you about that dream that I had of, of being in his house, um, my childhood home, and it was late at night and I wasn't able to sleep. I was scared about something and I went into his bedroom and um and I did what I always did when I was a child, when I was scared and I didn't know how to sleep. Um, I would just crawl into his bed. He usually wouldn't even wake up because he was such a deep sleeper. And I would just lie beside him and time my own breathing to his breathing. And because he was such a much bigger person than me at that time, his breaths were a lot deeper. And because he was already sleeping, his his exhalations were longer than his inhalations, which I learned much later in yoga is one of the easiest ways to trigger your parasympathetic nervous system to turn on and relax and be able to go to sleep. And as a child, I just was able to, I intuited it somehow. Um, so in the dream, I just went into his bedroom and got into his bed beside him and timed my breath with his until I was able to fall asleep. And so that for me felt like kind of a, kind of a resolution like I had done a lot of a lot of therapeutic work in that in that time around the qualities that I had previously that I had perceived in my parents prior to their deaths and then following their deaths and what I noticed was a very stark differentiation between my two parents where before they each died I had a very strong feeling that like my dad was the predominant positive influence on my life. And my mom was the predominant, let's say teacher in my life for things that things, patterns, behaviors that I don't want to perpetuate. And after they died, what I realized about each of them is that they both had qualities of the other. Um, and that was one of the, that was one of the biggest learnings for me of, of both of their deaths is that, my dad also taught me things that I don't want to repeat in my other relationships. And my mom taught me some incredibly positive qualities that I bring with me into all of my relationships. And I couldn't see those things before they died. So all of those hard feelings that I had toward my dad about the events that had transpired around my mom's death, that dream kind of told me like, hey, we're coming to a resolution on this and you can, you can re-acknowledge and reintegrate those feelings of trust and safety that your dad originally inspired in you. It was like my higher self was just retelling physical playing Chelsea, those things. Um, and I haven't had, I haven't had a whole lot of dreams about my, either of my parents actually since, since those, what I would call big dreams. So both of those dreams felt, 
felt like resolution for me in in different ways. Well, that's that's good, and I and you brought up a good point where so where some people take one set of dreams, let's say the positive dreams, as maybe a visitation of some sort. They may also take their negative ones as something that's wrong, or have the idea that maybe something's wrong with the deceased. Mm-hmm. And I think we were talking about that before, just like that's not always the case, you know, like especially with the research that it has something to do with your own grief for the most part when you're having these negative experiences. And so like mm-hmm. your dad being mm-hmm. sick and stuff, you know, like it's it's easy almost to project, oh, maybe he's, or if you're angry at him, oh, he's suffering because he needed to do more work, right? Like it's, like it's an easy uh, <laughs> projection, but really it has something to do with ourselves and what we need to do in our perception of the individual And how that grief is the most grimiest, right? Like that's the harder one to work through just because of the anger and the resentment that's associated with it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And uh, I also just remembered one of the earliest dreams that I had of him after he died before before the the re-sickness dreams started happening. My sister and I, uh, in the dream, my sister and I were in a huge box store. We were in like a Walmart or something buying supplies for a camping trip, which is something that my dad would often do with my sister and I when we were little. My mom never came. She hated camping. She hated sleeping away from a bathroom, hated bugs, didn't want to set up a tent, like never went camping. So it was just the three of us always. And in the stream, my sister and I were buying these camping supplies and we turned down one aisle with our cart and we were like pushing the cart together and talking about the supplies we were going to buy together. And our dad walked up toward us from the other end of the aisle and he didn't say anything to us but he just smiled and then he just kept on kept on going and that was that was probably like the quote-unquote nicest dream Mm -hmm. that I had of him so it was it was nice for me to at least have like that much contrast and not only have positive dreams of one parent and only quote-unquote negative dreams of the other parent well, I think a lot of people too, like just sort of through the research, most people who do have a negative dream will have a positive dream. And mm. the theory is once you start working through your grief, then those issues can be settled and that positive imagery can be more remembered um, mm. when you wake up. And I think it's fascinating. But most people, if they do have one type of dream, it's just positive. So like with your mm. mom, it's just positive, right? So you didn't have that contrast, but you didn't also have the same issues that you had with your dad. So I think it's mm-hmm. a great focus for anyone like looking at their dreams to understand a little bit more about the differences. And you really showcase that through your own experiences. Mm-hmm. So the question we like to ask our guests at the end is what dream would you want to have if you could tonight of someone who has died? Oh, anyone who has died, not just my parents. Anyone, yeah, <laughs> anyone you want. <laughs> I would really, really, really love to have a dream visitation by Hilma F. Clint, who is, it seems like it almost doesn't even do it justice to say that she's my favorite artist. Um, She is my favorite artist. She worked at the turn of the 20th century in, in Sweden on an extensive, hugely extensive and completely secret body of spiritual drawings, paintings and writings, which have only in very recent history, 2018 to be exact, have received widespread public recognition and acclaim to the point where art history is being rewritten so she can be inserted as the actual pioneer of abstraction and not Vasily Kandinsky, which is like a huge a huge revision to to the canon of art history and i found i found her work literally by accident while i was in graduate school and at a spirit level i was just trying to get through this degree and i needed to find other artists who had worked before me in a way that was similar to what i was trying to do which is to integrate art and spiritual practice which i was being told by the academy was not allowed and i was like well either i have to find a way to do this or I'm going to quit this degree because I can't make a compromise at this level. And I found this woman's work and I, I feel like, I feel like she's my art grandmother. Like if I trace the lineage of my art practice back to early abstraction at the turn of the 20th century, like she's, she's just right there. And I kind of, 
she kind of feels like kindred to me, like an ancestor or like a grandmother or like, you know, some some person who's just like whispering through the ether to me to do to to do the work that I'm doing and um, to make the art that I'm making. And I would love to connect with her in a dream. And I hope that any listener who doesn't know about Helena Afklin's work checks it out because it's pretty great. Uh, her name is spelled H-I-L-M-A-F-A-F, new word, Clint, K-L-I-N-T. Beautiful. Yeah, I haven't heard of her, so I'll check her out. And so together, where would you want to be? What's the location? Oh, I'd want to be, um, she envisioned a temple to house her paintings that is that was a spiral. Um, and she made architectural drawings for the temple, but it was never, it was not built in her lifetime or ever. And the exhibition of her work that made it so famous in, in contemporary art, in the contemporary art world uh, is the Guggenheim. It was shown at the Guggenheim in fall of 2018. And the Guggenheim is a spiral. So I think it's the closest, the closest thing in current reality that she could have ever hoped for. But I would like to have the dream in the temple that she envisioned. There you go. It's very possible. That's pretty cool. <laughs> I like that. And so her artwork would be around the temple. Is that the, the image? Well, I haven't seen the drawings that she made for the temple, but my understanding is that the the structure itself is a spiral, and so you would go in at the out in the at the outermost, like if you think of a snail shell, like where the snail comes out of its shell, you'd go in there, and then you're just going around and around and around, and you're circling closer and closer toward like a central, maybe like a sanctuary or a central point. Mm -hmm. That's what I imagine the temple would be like. Um, I don't know if her drawings of that space have been made public. Like her whole archive is now just being like really responsibly taken care of by a by a Swedish museum. And I think they're in the process of digitizing all of it. But like she wrote she wrote twenty six thousand pages of notes on things that had been channeled to her by her guides who instructed her to make these paintings and it's also all in Swedish I think mm -hmm. so I don't have I don't have access to that information but I would if those drawings ever become public I would love to see them and to see what she has well, envisioned can, for her work they, they don't need to be uh, public for you to envision them in your dream right so um, so true yeah so right true. <laughs> and so I'm curious so I'm guessing you guys are walking around and, and maybe chatting or just looking around what do you want to be at that center so when you get there what do you hope to be would it be like an art studio would it be like what do you what would you think would be there if it was your dream what I can see in my mind is that it's incredibly dark like kind of like an Egyptian tomb like there's daylight when you enter and then it just gets darker and darker and darker as you go in toward the center and then right at the center there's a light Ooh, I like that. <laughs> wow. That's uh, cool, yeah. You've got to give it up to the artist. Giving us a beautiful <laughs> dream sequence. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. I love it. I'm going to be thinking about that dream tonight. Uh, hopefully I get that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> let me know if you do. <laughs> Josh is just hiding in one of the corridors. Like, hey, guys. Just checking it out. Uh, it's funny. But even just being like to walk, just that imagery is so powerful. And hopefully, you know, you get to have a a dream like that. If it's not like that, be able to even have her in a dream to be able to see her, and even talk to her. Yeah, would it would be, be really cool. It would be beautiful. Hilma, if you're listening up there, you know that I would love to make contact with you. <laughs> All right. So with that, I'd like to thank you for coming on the podcast and being so authentic and telling your story. So like Sean was saying, you have a really good flow and you really you're really great at telling your story in your language. Is it like very mature? And you, so there's a deep understanding of death, dying and grief in your own life. And I'm guessing a lot of people will come and be comforted by you when they suffer their losses or if you need to sit by their bed and you'll be able to hold space for that. So I'm looking forward to seeing you grow as you move through your grief more and more every year. Um, but where can people find you? So in the meantime, where can people find you? People can find me on the interwebs. Um, my my art website is www. 
chelshotel.com. That's C-H-E-L-S-H-O-T-E-L.com. And my Instagram handle is at chelshotel, C-H-E-L-S-H-O-T-E-L. Um, I'm always happy to make new internet friends always happy to talk about the death and dying experience so if anybody is listening who has felt connected to what i've said please know that i'd love it if you if you reach out to me and say hi excellent thank you so much chelsea yeah that's uh yeah just uh, exactly what joshua said um you know you, you did a phenomenal job and you tell your story very well and and um you know you uh took us on a journey and and uh gave us some insights into your life and and uh, we really appreciate that yeah everyone can please check out our platform at griefdreams.ca for more information on the topic we added a donation button and there are perks to those who donate and thank you so much to those who do donate uh, if you have facebook you can join the grief dreams group you can share your dreams or hear more dreams of others we are on twitter and instagram at grief dreams and as always we love to end our podcast with love and gratitude from us to you Just myself, you have introduced yourself. This is a very good conversation.